Right, let's do some Q&A. So if you've been following me uh, on Facebook and YouTube, you know that I asked you guys to uh, to post questions, uh, post questions which you'd like me to address. So questions uh, about me personally and also, of course, about research. So in this video, I'll respond to some of these questions. Um, I don't think I'll be able to respond to all of them, especially the ones about uh, research and methodologies, because as I said in one of my comments, uh, this would require me to uh, record a separate video on its own. But let's hope that I can address as many as possible. So let's uh, jump straight into the Q&A. So I have these questions uh, here on my phone, so that's why I'll be looking down sometimes. Uh, the first question, uh, Joel, Joel Warbarton. Uh, by the way, if I get your name wrong, don't hate me for that. Uh, Joel is a... Uh, Joel is the favorite uh, character, my favorite character, not this Joe, not you Joe, but uh, Joel is my favorite character in my favorite game, which is uh, The Last of Us. So that's like an extra, extra insight before we get to the question. And now uh, Joel's uh, question is as follows. I'd like you to address the use of quantitative language and qualitative research writing. For example, three out of ten participants said this, all but one said that, etc. I know there are mixed views on this and I'd be interested in your thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, you are right that there are mixed views on this and I don't think there is a, a right or wrong answer. I can tell you what I prefer and why. And of course, I, I'm not alone in this uh, view. So there are two opposing views, two opposing camps. Uh, some of them argue that we shouldn't be using any numbers in qualitative research. So we're by using numbers, even when saying, let's say, 15 out of 20 participants said this, uh, by using numbers, uh, these people who oppose the idea, uh, they say you're quantifying qualitative data. So you're trying to make it quantitative and there is no need for it. So these people argue that we just don't want this kind of language. Uh, I don't agree with these people and like I said there are many people who disagree and I feel like uh, we, cannot, we, we cannot just not use any numbers because numbers uh, they do help us uh, they do help us see uh, for example how uh, prevalent how dominant how common was a given view I'm not saying uh, again the opponents say you cannot uh, you cannot use these numbers you cannot say that just because the theme was discussed so many times it means it's more important than the other of course not and if a theme was discussed once by one person it's still important if it's important for your study if it's relevant for your study so i'm not saying that these numbers define whether a theme was important or not but you have to agree that if you see uh if you read about a certain point of view or especially controversial point of view and and you hear that 19 out of 20 participants express this point of view is different than if you here that is is just a point of view expressed by one person so it's even is just giving justice to uh, to the data to other participants uh, possibly who did not express this point of view so uh, so in short there are different opinions on this but to me it is uh, i just don't agree with not using numbers i don't think it's good for for research and i know there are people who don't like just this extreme let's uh, call it approach and using numbers where really we are trying to quantify that data uh, but there are also people who just don't agree with any numbers and i recently heard that i recently heard uh, this opinion there was a supervisor one of my clients my, my students online students uh, told me about the supervisor who just didn't want to hear about any numbers at all and i find it a little bit odd and i i don't think it's a good idea so yeah so there are mixed views and you have every right to uh just to take your position where you want to stand and, and be ready to justify it. And this kind of uh, leads me to the second question here. So this is uh, asked by Peter Law, Law. How do you develop confidence in defending a qualitative method? I say, I always say to, to my students uh, when we talk about, for example, the research design, quite often, uh, so when my students come to me, obviously more often than not, it means that their supervisor is not doing the best job of supervising. Uh, so we discuss their research design, qualitative data analysis, etc., etc. So, uh, and quite often I tell them to take a certain approach, whether it's approach to how to structure a chapter or approach to collecting data or analyzing the data. And quite often they are worried and they tell me that their supervisors would not 
uh, would not agree because they uh, they don't think their supervisor would agree because their supervisor told them, for example, to use a different approach. Uh, and I usually, uh, usually tell them that, well, you haven't tried, so you, you won't find out before you try. So I usually recommend that they do uh, go back to their supervisor and explain that they do want to have a different approach, except that this time I want them to provide evidence for why. So support their argument with evidence. So that basically this refers to defending your approach, uh, unless I misunderstood that question, but uh, this refers to, uh, to defending your approach because I feel like in academic context in general, but this mainly, I'm mainly talking about the relationship between you and your supervisor, because I'm aware that a majority, the majority of my viewers are students. Uh, so I feel like, and I always say that if you have a good reason, if you have a good reason to, uh, oppose your supervisor's view if you show them that you know what you're doing what why you want to do this what you're talking about usually they will agree so uh, we do feel we do have this feeling as students that the supervisor they kind of impose their view upon us but it's not true they usually in most cases they just kind of want to help so that's why they are doing this they are assuming oh he or she doesn't really know so let's let's uh, suggest that he or she will should follow this approach. It's not that they, they won't accept any other approach. The moment you you face them and you tell them, well, this is what I want to do, uh, they usually, and, and show them evidence, usually they will be more than happy to, uh, to agree on this on this approach. And uh, this works in, in any, just generally in the academic context, in the context, context of research. There is a story, I, I told this story somewhere in one of my videos, so here it is again. So. As a master's student, I, I developed a questionnaire. I had uh, I collected a lot of data, so I had I think about 400 or maybe even 500 responses, in addition to my other methods. So so that, that was quite a lot, and I put obviously a lot of time and effort into collecting that data. And then as I was uh, about to analyze this data, I realized that in my questionnaire, I do not have a neutral response. So I don't have a I don't know response so as as you know uh, when we have this likert or likert scale i'll never learn how to pronounce it correctly um we have strongly agree agree disagree strongly disagree and usually uh, in the middle we have you know something like i don't have an opinion or i don't know i did not do this i forgot i just simply forgot to add this response and i already had collected all that data and i had probably about three or four weeks left to uh, to submit so so basically you don't know if that's how it works in in all contexts but i had about roughly i think six weeks for my master's dissertation so maybe eight I, i'm not sure now really uh, anyway the point is that i did not have the response so that was a big big problem i cannot analyze how can i analyze the data if i don't have the neutral response it's not i don't think it's valid this way but then what i did uh, that was you know just the only scenario the only way uh, to solve the problem was I, I started to think okay surely there must be people who don't agree with having this response you know surely there are some some limitations of giving people that response I don't know so uh, so I decided I will find these people who argued that and sure enough there are just a handful of people that I found but there were authors people researchers who argue against using that neutral response. So basically they, they said things like it gives, it encourages uh, the questionnaire respondent to just to kind of tick that box every time. So just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, some other, other arguments uh, as well. So what I did, uh, of course, I argued that from the very beginning, this was my idea and, and I provided evidence for why I backed this uh, view with, with the literature. So the conclusion is that they, they liked uh, the dissertation that accepted my point of view. Of course, uh, of course, this is not exactly uh, your traditional or, you know, common way of approaching things. So basically it's a little bit of cheating, I guess, because I just, I just forgot to have that response, but then I made it look like I just planned it. So, but the whole conclusion to this story is that you can, uh, if you have enough evidence if you have enough uh, arguments backed from uh, you know with uh, enough literature to back that argument this is how you defend your decision uh, okay it's been 10 minutes i'm definitely recording another 
video right after this. So for this video, we'll uh, we'll finish with uh, with another question. Uh, as I said, the research-related questions, as I thought, they do take a while. So I think in the next one, I'll mainly focus on on the personal ones. But this one, uh, this question is what I'll conclude with. So the question is asked by um, Eva L. Eva L. Uh, how to finish a thesis in a month for a PhD student? Is that is that possible? How is the quality? No, <laughs> it's not possible, Eva. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's not possible at all, even remotely possible. You cannot. How? I'm not even sure. I wasn't sure if it's if I misunderstood that question. Maybe you mean like conclude your PhD if you already have some stuff. But as you just heard, I I had. I think about roughly about eight weeks for my master's study, which I think is quite an intense program. Yeah, no, no words, <laughs> not possible at all. You're not gonna finish your PhD in a month. Yeah, okay, so um, like I said, I don't want this to be very long, so I think I'll just finish this one. I'll record another Q&A. Thanks for your questions. Do ask me more questions. Uh, hopefully I can every now and then record these sessions just as a reminder not really related but kind of if you struggle with your phd if your data with your data analysis your research in any way uh, do explore the content on this channel do explore what i what i post on my website and facebook and if you feel that you still require maybe a more personalized uh, personalized approach more guidance feel free to explore uh, the different services that i offer including one-to-one uh, -one tutorials through Zoom. So now take care, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, see you soon and in another Q&A session.